Good evening. Welcome to the Yorktown Central School District Board of Education meeting for January 22nd, 2018. We are going to start our meeting um, by appointing a new trustee. As everybody remembers, at our last meeting, we had discussed that we were going to reach out to what we believed was our strong 1A candidate at from our last trustee appointment a few months ago, and we have done that, and her name is Lisa Roll, and so it is our intention tonight to appoint her, and everybody's okay with that, correct? All right. Yes. So, can I have a motion, be it resolved, that the Board of Education here... Uh, Hereby appoints Lisa Roll to the vacant board seat as a result of the resignation of Tom Donatelli effective January 22nd, 2018 until the next annual election of board members on May 15, 2018. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Can you please stand and take the oath of office? the duties of the office of board trustee Yorktown Central School District according to the best of my ability. Congratulations. Welcome aboard. We are excited to have you. Thank you. Okay. Can I please have a motion to go into executive session to re the, review the employment history of particular individuals and negotiations under the Taylor Law? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Can I have a motion to go back into public session? Yes. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. So we, but she's good. She, I mean, she's, uh, she's all good. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Yorktown Central School District Board of Education meeting for January 26, 2018. Can we please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance given by Mr. D. Pasquale's students and then remain standing for a moment of silence for our armed forces and those in our community that have lost loved ones especially the father of Linda Arco, the mother of Keith Smith, the mother of David Millenstein, the father of Teresa Carey, the mother of Val Murphy, the father of Matt Ladka, and the mother-in-law of Ellen Kahn. Thank you, everyone. Um, we are going to start with public comment. Is there anybody in the audience wishing to speak on agenda-related items? All right. We can go right to good news. We have the middle school visiting us, right, Dr. Hatter? This is so exciting. I've been privy to some of the work that our middle school students are doing, and I think you'll find this absolutely fascinating. The topic of the presentation this evening is how science changes history, and I'm really excited to hear what our students have to say, and I'm sure you'll really enjoy the presentation. I see some very dirty water there, but I have a feeling that we're in for a surprise, and no, you don't need to uh, try the water through the filter. But I'd like, to turn the <laughs> I'd like to turn the presentation over to the principal of Mildred E. Strang Middle School, Ms. Marie Horowitz. Good evening. Dr. Hatter, Mrs. O'Shea, Mr. Cole, Mrs. Carbone, and the trustees of the board. Mr. Shal and Ms. Shiano and myself are honored to present tonight's good news for MESMS. One principle of the 2020 vision plan that Dr. Hatter has outlined is to develop citizens who are engaged in the world around them and who have capacity to influence change. Our students and the YCSD community has engaged in the world by reaching out to others in need. MESMS sent a contribution, letters, and cards to a school in Texas that faced hardships after Hurricane Harvey. MESMS and the YCSD community also participated in Pillows for Patients, the drive to benefit the Children's Hospital of Puerto Rico in Bayamón, Puerto Rico. We shipped over 800 pounds of books, pillows, toys, and sanitizers um, to the Children's Hospital, and it arrived on time for Three Kings Day, which is when they exchanged gifts. So on behalf of MESMS and the YCSD community, I'd also like to thank the board for your wonderful contributions, the bears, the hand sanitizers, and contributing to the mailing of the goods. Thank you so much for your support. 
I'd also like to give special recognition to Mrs. Marion Ritchie, uh, Mrs. Penny Jones, and Mrs. Lizette Gonzalez, who organized and led the drive for MESMS. We're encouraged to focus on education of the whole child through academics, the arts, character development, esteem, and service opportunities. Tonight, Mr. D. Pasquale and his students are going to show us how we are meeting academic standards and district initiatives while learning to serve others. Mr. D. Pasquale. Thank you, Ms. Horowitz. The idea for this came about from a conversation I had with Ms. Horowitz. I believe it was right before school started, and she was talking about kind of a science initiative. And I came up with the idea, how, did, how has science changed history? Because my whole world kind of revolves around, <clears throat> around history. So I, just, I just decided to design a couple of lessons with my seventh and eighth graders um, on that subject. For my seventh graders, we started with the history of fire and how the ability to make fire changed human civilization in the course of history. And we actually tried to make friction fires using a bow drill method, and we did the science behind that, the different types of woods, the degree, and things like that. And then we, and I had another con con conversation with Marie, and she talked about the UN um, sustainability goals. And you can see those, those sustainability goals up there, and there's a whole lot of them. And we were talking about how could we fit history and the greater good into a lesson. And what struck me there was, right there, is the clean water and, and uh, sanitation goal. And when we study the, uh, the progressive era and the end of the Gilded Age, we talk about all the things that needed to be changed in America or continuously changed in America. And I kind of had this thought back to when I was in graduate school, and I had to sit through this really horrendously boring lecture on the history of water filtration and urbanization. And I said, what better way to do this than to pass on that horrible experience to my students, but try to make it a little bit more interesting. And, and I said, okay, I can do this, because we talk about how urbanization led to overcrowding, and overcrowding leads to all these horrific problems. And one of the biggest problems, especially in New York City, was the lack of clean water for those that lived on the Lower East Side and in areas with tenements. So instead of just talking about water filtration, I said, how can we learn the history of it? And we took that history, going all the way back to ancient Greece and going through the early 20th century, and put it together and then built that filter, which you'll see here today. And uh, these students here who are really some of my most enthusiastic students, it's really fun every day. They're all in the same period. They're in my fifth period class. But they come in after lunch, and it's a pleasure. I look forward to that class every day. We're gracious enough to volunteer. So we're going to have our first um, pre presenter up here, and that's, and that's Abby. So please come up. Okay. So how does the ability to drink clean water change history? OK, so some key facts are that 844 million people lack a reliable and clean drinking water source. Globally, at least 2 billion people use a drinking water source contaminated with feces. Contaminated, uh, contaminated water can transmit s diseases such as diarrhea, cholera, cholera, dysentery, typhoid, and polio. Contaminated drinking water is estimated to cause 500 to 1,000 dysentery death e deaths each year. By 2025, half of the world's population will be living in water-stressed areas. In low- and middle-income countries, 38% of healthcare facilities lack an improved water source, 19% do not have improved sanitation, and 35% lack so water and soap for hand washing. Yeah. So how can the simple water filter help the world and change history? It's water. And that was, really, that was really the key, is how can we learn the history of it and then how could this be exported um, to help people around the world who live in these water-stressed areas? So the beginning of the history of that filter and how we build it, so let me start with the first layer of our, of our filter. I'm Jordan, I'm Jordan Catalan, and uh, I'm doing the layer claw. This is the first layer of our filter. <laughs> the idea of using cloth goes back thousands of years to ancient Greece. Hippocrates, the father of medicine, believed clean water was essential to health. He began to experiment using cloth to purify water. He boiled water and then poured it 
through Hippocrates' sleeve, an early form of filter. Hello, um, my name is Emily Sunas, <clears throat> and my layer is sand. To further filter water, a smaller and a finer filter is needed. The concept of using sand for water filtration can be documented to the 17th century. Sir Francis Bacon believed he could use sand to purify seawater. It didn't work, but experimentation with sand continued. Hello, I am Trevor Griffiths, and my layer is charcoal. This is the final layer. So uh, charcoal was introduced into water filtration systems in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Char charcoal filters uses uh, the process of absorption Filter, uh, it, it filters the microbes out of the water and all of the bacterial harms. And it's credited with helping to stop cholera and epidemics in cities. If you see here, what we have is a picture from early, the early, 19th, uh, early 1900s. This is New York City. This picture was taken by Jacob Reese, famous photographer, what we call muckraker of the time period. And what you see there is the back of a tenement house. To the left of the picture, you'll see the outhouse, and to, right in the center, that's the water pump. So it's pretty obvious how that problem, especially for a cholera epidemic, could be created. If they had had this simple filter there, um, all these problems would have, for the most part, been alleviated. And we see this throughout history uh, as a big problem. So we see, not just in New York City, but around the world, this could have been a, a big game changer. Hi, my name's Chin Mai, and um, so portable water was essential to society. It's what society is really centered around. And during the turn of the 20th century, many cities from the U.S. Uh, suffered from contaminated, contaminated water, and that was a problem because it got lots of people sick and epidemics started happening. Um, so simple water filters could have just saved thousands of lives during that era. Um, and because of urbanization, New York City's water was unsuitable, so therefore the Croton Aqueduct was built in the 19th century. It now serves millions of gallons of purified water to the five boroughs of New York City. And we learned that the largest water pur purification uh, center in New York was built on the Croton Aqueduct right here in the, in, in, in the Hudson Valley in the Bronx. So, and it uses the technology that we're showing you today is the essential heart of the filter that, that feeds New York City, one of the largest cities in the United States. How this works into sustainability is that these filters are cheap to make. The average cost of each filter is only about $10. We could sustain them because everything that you're going to see can be found throughout the world. The buckets are relatively cheap, and the three layers can either be made or recycled. And, it would, and they can filter thousands of gallons of water bef before needing to be replenished. And they're also life-saving. A simple char charcoal or biofilter can purify thousands of gallons of water, and they are basically the same level as if you use a Brita filter at home. What we're doing here has that same level, level of filtration, so it can be used all around the world to get rid of those, har those, those microbes. So now we're going to actually build those sustainable filters. Let's start with our cloth and then we'll get to our sand and our charcoal. So we're going to start with our layers of cloth and they're going down against the bottom of the bucket. The bucket does have a small <coughs> hole in the bottom of it for the water to come out to. Thank you too much. Sure. So, yeah. dump a couple in there. Just, that's why we have the clear ones. So you'll see our water. Look at all this great. Oh, that's right. Show the board. There you go. This is the water that we're going to be using. Tell me. sand act mainly as sediment filters. They're going to be taking out the dirt, leaves, grass, whatever you see there. 
So it's just acting as a typical filter or, or strainer. Good. And then finally, our charcoal. This is, is pure wood charcoal. You can't use uh, anything like max lead or anything like that. It's just no <laughs> 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 chemical. You just, you just be adding chemicals to the water. Uh, what we're using here is pure wood charcoal. And charcoal is used for, for many things throughout history. It's even used uh, for upset stomachs beyond, and, and for water filtration and beyond for fuel. Uh, the, the beginnings of charcoal that go back to ancient of what's called the collier industry. All right, so now we'll start taking our lovely water. drink it anymore. Dish. Wow, yeah. great job. Like this. Yeah. <laughs> to be absent tomorrow, so I'm going to also drink. <laughs> <laughs> it tastes good. It tastes great, less filling. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, what we've built is your Brita filter at home. 
um, in, in, in a larger form. And this could do about over a thousand gallons of water before you can replenish what's in there. So this could really be exported around the world. And even the places here, we studied even places in the United States, when Michigan, things like that, that have had all sorts of water crises. This could be a simple, very simple solution. It's sustainable, it's usable, and it changes the system. Any questions? I have a question, because you mentioned Flint, Michigan. So this, we know, takes out impurities. Does it take out things like lead and, and chemicals in the water as well? Yes, it takes out chemicals. The, the charcoal absorbs what's there, and what comes out, the carbon in the charcoal, acts as an actual filter. That's why it's called a biofilter. So it could be used. When they switched, when they switched their, um, the pipes off of the Flint River to the Detroit River, or whatever it was, um, that, the, uh, that was one of the things that it had was better filtration coming off of those old pipes. So that, that was one thing. That's why they couldn't boil the water in Flint uh, because of the lead content of it, but filtering it would have helped them uh -huh. do that. So this is something that really could have been used very simply around the world. Yes. So I'm just curious: is the is the order that you layer the uh, <coughs> materials? Yes. Thank you. Is that is that important? Because I would have thought it would it be is. the other way around. No, it is. You're going from big to small. You want your smallest on the bottom to okay. be that final last stop. Basically, when you're hitting the charcoal on the top here, you're starting the purification process. As it goes through there, it's taking out uh, the sentiment in layers. So the one that comes out the bottom is going to be the most filtered. So you want to start it at the top and kind of kind of like a reverse pyramid in terms of filtration. So that's your that's your finest mesh almost. Yes, that's your finest. So if, even if you go home, you have one of those pure water taps or something like that. When you look on the bottom of it, you're going to see today they use like a plastic mesh on the bottom. That's what our cloth is acting as when it's actually a finer one. That's why it's going through uh, slower because we put three layers of it. So that's acting as your, your, your finest of them all, is, is the cloth there. And that goes all the way back to ancient Greece. Hippocrates actually boiled water and then, as uh, our students said, poured it through what he called Hippocrates' sleeve, which kind of like was, a, was like a linen sock almost. He was filtering water. That, that uh, idea of boiling it disappears uh, throughout the 17th, 18th, and into the 19th century. That was one of the main things they could have done was to boil water. In, in Europe and the United States, but they didn't because they didn't have the know-how to do that. Uh, the germ theory was uh, was experimental in the 19th century, and they, they didn't know. All they had to do was boil it to uh, take a lot of the microbes out of it. But it the idea goes back to ancient Greece. I love this lesson. This was really Great. cool. Any other, other questions? Thank you. We Thank are really, you. really impressed, and you were really brave to drink that water. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as I told Dr. Hatter, what you don't know is we snuck the water into all of the water. <laughs> 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 we figured. So you're all that. They started about two months Thanks. ago doing this. Thank you. Um, so, Ron, you want to say something? Yes. So thank you so much, Abby, Emily, Jordan, Chin, uh, Chinmay, Trevor, and uh, Mr. D. Pasquale. I really appreciate you presenting this evening. It was a real learning experience for me. I learned a lot with regard to water filtration, so thank you so much for coming out. I know it's a school night. I know you have homework and all kinds of other things that are uh, pressing on your time, but thank you for sharing this. This is e-steam work at its finest. When you look at the UN Sustainable Goals, this is goal six that talks about clean water for everyone, and it fit, the two ideas fit perfectly together. Uh, the one thing that had the my wheels turning was with regard to sodium content in the water. So certainly uh, you've demonstrated that you can remove microorganisms and, and things of that <laughs> sort. Um, we have a presentation this evening from one of our fifth grade students, and it, it fits in line with water, except this is water for electricity, and we, the young man, uh, Jack, who I'll call up in a moment, and I had a conversation about um, Puerto Rico and the impact of the hurricane on Puerto Rico and how this could have maybe helped with the electricity piece. Would this method also sift out sodium from water content? The only way to sift out sodium I know is, is, to, is to boil it. Um, the, that's where, in, with the sand filters, Sir Francis Bacon, who was a renowned um, uh, 17th century writer and scientist and things like that, his original idea with sand was desalinization, but it didn't work. As far as I know, the only way to desalinate water is to boil it and then catch the vapor, put it through a... Uh, uh, 
a tube which condenses it, and as it then cools in that tube, using gravity and cooling, it comes out, comes out cool. Uh, so it kind of, that, th that was one of the original ideas, was to desalinate water using sand, but it never, it doesn't take it out. Wow, that is wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you Boys and girls, Ms. Steve Pasquale, Ms. Horowitz, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So before they before we take an intermission, uh, and we generally would take an intermission at this point, but before we do that, uh, we have another student in the audience. We have one of our wonderful fifth grade students from Crompon School here, Jack Frechette. And last week at Crompon Science Fair, Mrs. Shiland, his teacher, called me over and said, Dr. Hatter, you have to see this. This is E-STEAM at its finest. And as I heard Jack present, and I spoke to Jack's father, I was very inspired by the work that Jack had, en had endeavored, and we as part of our education report this evening, Mrs. O'Shea will be talking to you about all that went into those beautiful science projects that you t were witness to last week at Crompond. We'll talk about, or Ms. Mrs. O'Shea will talk about all the great work that went in and the process that went into that. But we would like Jack to present his project to you this evening and then we'll recess and we'll go into the other reports for the evening, but we're just being cognizant of homework and bedtime and other things that happen when you're in fifth grade. So at this point, um, Mrs. Shiland, actually, I will turn it over to you, and can you introduce Jack to us? You're at the point, or actually, Mrs. Roberts, is, Dr. Roberts, you're here. Dr. Roberts, may I call you up to speak to? I was going to go after Jack. We'll go after Jack. Jack is a major. Dr. Roberts, would you care to say a few words at the podium to just talk about the science fair that, that you had? And I know I'm putting you on the spot here. <laughs> uh, and you can introduce Jack as well. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It's wonderful to see all of you. Um, we're very proud to be presenting Jack to all of you this evening. We did have our grade five science fair last week. Um, it was absolutely spectacular. Our students impressed us from the beginning of the process, which really starts in around the end of September, October, when we start with our controlled study unit, and it takes us all the way to January. What we've um, really worked on very diligently this year is not only looking at the new science standards, but also um, looking at our E-STEAM work and how do we connect all, all of this work together. We will be debriefing shortly in terms of looking at the science fair. Um, that we conducted in, in addition to the new science standards and E-STEAM, and then how do we make everything more pronounced in terms of E-STEAM. Um, what Jack has done is pretty extraordinary because he truly will demonstrate for you E-STEAM because he really had the empathy part it, at the center of all of his work. So he's been waiting patiently to present, and we proudly present uh, Jack Frechette. <laughs> Hello, my name is Jack Frechette, and I am a fifth grader in Mrs. Shiland's class. The reason I am here today is to talk about how we learned about the scientific method in science and experimented using controlled studies, then created our own controlled study for the science fair. I also want to let you know about our project challenges we did in ESTEAM, the books we read called Max Axiom and Fuzzy Mud the articles in the UDHR and how they all helped teach us about empathy and science because they are all connected. I also will show you my experiment and talk about the fact of how my experiment can help others, which shows empathy. All right, controlled studies. Scientists can use controlled studies for good, like solving world problems or curing diseases or just to make money. We did many controlled studies in science lab that taught us about this idea. In ELA, we read a graphic novel called Max Axiom, Super Scientist. It's a series. Max explains how he used the scientific method to help protect the city. He used the scientific method to make a controlled study to figure out how to build the strongest levy in order to have an effect what, on what could happen to the city, which would have been a severe flood. His work can show us how empathy works. He was saving a city from something horrible. Our class actually repeated his experiment in class with different materials and then researched levees and how to make concrete from natural materials.
Another book that is East theme related and helped with my science fair project was called Fuzzy Mud. It is all about a scientist who is searching for a clean source of energy which nearly destroyed the world. You will soon see that my science project can re relate to that in a way where clean energy is being used to, to produce, a, where clean energy is being produced so that we won't be worried about losing oil. Actually, we wouldn't even need oil. You could use electric cars and heat houses with electric heat, all powered by the idea in my science project, salt water. There would be no pollution. You're probably thinking, if this is all possible, why haven't we had clean energy for years? My answer to that was discovered while researching. Being able to use salt water for electricity is a pretty new topic for mankind. It was just recently discovered as being an option. East theme projects and science projects should always connect the empathy in some way. In the UDHR Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 25 states everyone in the world should have good living conditions and health care. Electricity is a basic need. Building the tallest towers was all about keeping people out of the flood zone and building levees which are used to block off coming water. Or like we did in science lab, figuring out a better solution to the chemicals and baby diapers can help the environment. You can see where empathy comes in there. Empathy is used here by knowing people are in a dangerous situation and helping out or taking care of the earth. I got the idea for my science fair project from my dad when one day he said, did you know that you can make electricity from salt water? This got me curious, so when the science fair came around, I was thinking of a way to use this idea and make it into a controlled study. When I first started, things got a little out of hand for me. Researching at first was not all that easy. I was not closely looking at the website and ended up hating the research. I eventually realized through a talk that I needed to read closely and really take in the website's information. After that, I was good to go. I was able to research with lots of ease and ended up getting many facts from the websites I first could not get anything from. As a result, now, I now feel I'm a better researcher than I first was. Also, when I used technology, my mom helped me to record my experiment and edit with iMovie. Thank you for listening to this speech. Now, without further ado, I present to you my project, Saltwater Charge. I hope this helps you to imagine the possibility of a new, clean source of energy. Michelle, you can put it on this table here. <laughs> Thank you. you. Want to turn it so that it can get for the camera too? Okay. He can turn. So I asked myself, what effect will different amounts of salt water and electricity have on how much salt of uh, how much salt water uh, salt in the water would have on how much electricity is produced? So I had different amounts of salt in each cup. And I thought that cup C would have the most electricity because it had the most salt in it. And so what changed was the amount of salt. And the dependent variable was the amount of, milli of milliampers produced. Oh, thank you. So there was a lot of control variables, but you can get idea by the same electrical tester, same cups, same water, same salt, and same copper and zinc, right? So cup A had 1.1 milliampers of electricity. Cup B had one and yeah, nine hundredths of nine tenths, sorry, of electricity, milliampers. And cup C had two point one hundredths of milli milliampers of electricity. So yeah. My hypothesis was correct. Questions? <laughs> so the most, the one with the highest concentration of salt, the one that had the most salt in it, produced the most electricity. Yeah. So what Jackie showed is they yeah. had 
figure out a way to test it with the salt <coughs> water and the, the copper and the zinc, correct, buddy? Yeah. And he read it. The way he measured it was by reading this electrical tester. Electrical tester to figure out how much electrical charges were brought by the different amounts of salt water. Okay. Mm -hmm. Jack, do we, know how much, do we know how much salt is in the water in like the oceans? Like, does it measure to cup one, two, or three? Do we know that? Like, how much salt is yeah, in the oceans? Yeah, because you're you're measuring the amount of salt in your water to say that, that we could make electricity from it. So do we know, I'm assuming you're saying because we can then take electricity from our oceans. So do we yeah. know which our oceans are more closely like, one, two, or three in your cup? Pro A, B, C? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Tons of salt, I'd say, yeah. I always learn that water and electricity, no, no, but this is fascinating it's here. It's the impurities in the water. Salt can be the impurity. Very interesting. That's so interesting. And Jack, when we met last week, you told me about, gee, what could this mean for a country like, uh, that under any country that was without power, whether it was from a storm or just in general, that they don't have electricity. What could this mean for them? They could have a way to get electricity now. Uh -huh. They could have a good, healthy source of electricity. There's a lot of water in the ocean. Yeah. That's, that, that, this is a wonderful project. Thank you. Anybody have questions for it? So I have a question. Uh, what was the most fun thing about this project, or the most fun thing that you may have learned from the project? I'd say I had real, a lot of fun doing the experiment. That's great. Great. That's great. Any other? Anybody else? Yeah, I have a question. Um, and I actually feel like I'm talking to a real scientist here. <laughs> I feel like you're going to have the answer. I know you will. Um, has there, have you ever thought that any of the other impurities that we find in water could potentially react in the same way? It's possible. I'm not exactly sure. Yeah. But Is it hey, something you would ponder to test at one point? It's another controlled study to do. Yeah. 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 Good stuff. You can come back and show us the results of that one. It's going to be a yeah. science research project yeah. when you get to yeah. the high school. Yeah, wait till high school. You did a phenomenal <laughs> job. Very impressive. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So th this is the entree into our education report. However, we wanted Jack to present. And Jack, your presentation was absolutely wonderful. You did such an amazing job tonight. And thank you for coming. And I know that there's a lot of other things that you could have been doing rather than talking to a bunch of adults about science. But we really thank you for coming out. I learned a lot. I'll speak for myself. I learned a lot from hearing you speak. So thank you so much for coming out tonight. Yes, so thank you. Recess. Yes, we can take a little recess. Jack, thank you so much. We appreciate it. You're all very it. welcome. And Mrs. <laughs> Shiland and Dr. Roberts, thank you so much for championing this work and being such supporters. Dr. Roberts, you've been an absolute champion of all of the East Team work and the UN Sustainable Goal work. And thank you so much for your leadership. And Ms. Shiland, thank you so much for your leadership Our in pleasure. the class as well. Thank you. I told Jack when he went to Nobel Prize, he would never come back. <laughs> <laughs> So we're back then. So that was our segue right into the education war? Yes. At this point, we'll turn okay. the program over to Mrs. O'Shea, who will present from the podium. And she'll talk. We, we often get to see the wonderful work at the science fairs and, and the finished products. But there's a lot of work, as was mentioned here. This begins pretty early in the school year. These don't just happen. There's a lot that goes in. And Mrs. O'Shea will share with us all of the steps and all the things that happen in advance of that work. So just to follow up on some of the information that Dr. Roberts, Mrs. Shiland shared regarding the grade five science fair, we wanted to give you a little bit of background about the curriculum work that goes on in order to present these type of events and experiences for our students. What we use in our K-5 program for science curriculum is something called Science 21, and it's been developed out of uh, Putnam Northern Westchester BOCES through a collaboration of all the component districts. Um, the program goals for Science 21 are to foster a learning environment which all students acquire the knowledge, skills, and habits of the mind to become independent, collaborative, become problem solvers, self-directed learners, 
And some of the skills that are embedded within the Science 21 curriculum from K-5 is to engage in an act, active acquisition of, of knowledge in the sciences, to be encouraged to take risks and ask questions, to engage in the planning, conduct, and communication of investigations, to engage in identifying real-world problems, designing solutions, evaluating efforts, communicating findings, to engage in a variety of child-centered learning experiences, um, and to assess students in a variety of ways regarding their knowledge <coughs> of science. In Science 21, there are, there are big ideas or unifying themes throughout the curriculum. There are vertical um, themes and there are horizontal themes, vertical meaning uh, K-5 and horizontal across a grade level. So for example, a unifying theme, a vertical theme is the, is the through the grades, is student is a scientist, and that comes up over and over throughout the curriculum. A horizontal theme that you might see in grade two is measuring changes in our world, and that would look for all the second grade classes, they would be looking at the tools that we use to observe and measure, uh, observe and measure changes in energy, changing in living organisms, and changes in the environment. When we look specific to the fifth grade, the fifth grade Science 21 curriculum that all of our fifth grade students are exposed to is, is called Interactions in the, in the Natural World. The units of study there are interactions of chemical matter, interactions in the micro world, meaning cells and, and cell theory, interactions in, human in the human body, and interactions in the environment. As you heard earlier, the Science Fair project is something that's been going on at Crown Pond and in our, science, our fifth grade classes for many, many years, and it does directly go back to all of those components of the Science 21 Grade 5 curriculum that speak to interactions um, in the, in, of chemical matter and controlled studies. As, Mrs. As Dr. Roberts shared earlier today, the Science Fair project offers students an opportunity to showcase proficiency in performing a controlled study, to reflect on all prior scientific learning, to think of a scientific question that they would like answered, and to present coherently. It's expected that students demonstrate creativity, scientific information, and skill in explaining each project that they develop. To assist in the long-term planning of this project, because as Dr. Roberts shared, the unit of study starts in September and builds until they're able to present their project in January, the teachers have developed a timeline that helps the students with the pacing of the long-term project, and that talks about um, a timeline for the approval of the research question, a rough draft of the controlled study, uh, an entry form, and a final copy. And at each step of the way, the teachers are uh, assisting the students throughout the journey. As students work on these projects, um, they are directed to refer to two uh, rubrics that um, represent the controlled study and the science fair rubric. They're reviewed in class and it gives the, the students an, and the parents a clear understanding of what's expected for the students to um, complete all the aspects of not only the controlled study but the science fair presentation as well. Here's just a few pictures of the science fair from last week. Um, when Dr. Hatter and I had an opportunity to visit, as well as almost all of our fifth grade parents who were there uh, in the evening on Thursday, there were many, many presentations and students were actively engaged in sharing their research and ans asking and answering questions um, throughout the process. And it was really nice to see the level of rigor that our students have um, challenged themselves with in terms of their research project. What was also nice is that on January 19th, the third grade students from both Brookside and Mohansic were able to go to Crom Pond and uh, walk through and learn from our fifth grade students about their science fair project. So as you can see, the science, the science 21 curriculum and the science fair project that's been in place has really been embedded in the uh, learning standards as they have existed through New York State for science education. Now we're in the process of transitioning to the new New York State uh, pre-K through 12 science standards. This year, the 17 and 18 school year, is the initial phase of a multi-year transition process towards these standards. This school year focuses on raising awareness and building the capacity of our educators around these new standards. And then we'll move into a transition and implementation phase and an impl implementation and sustainability phase. So right now, as we 
as our teachers are getting acclimated with what the new standards are asking us to do, how we need to look at our current curriculum and see what changes we need to, to make as we move forward, we have a lot of supports in place for our educators. We have grade level reps in all of the buildings at, each, at uh, K through five who attend meetings over at BOCES where this information is shared, the standards are looked at, activities are discussed, and they come back and share that information with their grade level team. This summer we had fourth and fifth grade teachers in teams of three working uh, on their own in district to make a comparison between our existing curriculum through Science 21 and what perhaps changes we would need as we move forward into the new standards and the new expectations. What's different as we move into the new New York State Science Learning Standards, um, this framework outlines three dimensions that are needed to provide students with high quality science education. The Integration of these three dimensions provides students with the context for content in science, how science knowledge is acquired and understood, and how sciences are connected through concepts that have universal meaning across the disciplines. So the three dimensions are science and engineering practices, dis disciplinary core ideas, and cross-cutting concepts. So any inquiry-based approach, um, the expectation is that students will engage in practices not, near, not merely learning about them secondhand. So when we look at the science and engineering practices that are identified in the new standards, there are eight of them, and it all speaks to um, developing students' understanding of the nature of science and engineering, asking questions, developing and using models, planning and carrying out investigations, analyzing and interpreting data, using mathematics and, and computational thinking, constructing explanations, engaging in an argument based on evidence, and ob obtaining, evaluating, and communicating information. The second domain is, is um, disciplinary core ideas. The continuing expansion of scientific knowledge makes it unrealistic to teach all the ideas related to a given discipline uh, in, in exhaustive detail. An important role of science education is to prepare students with sufficient core knowledge so that they can acquire additional information on their own as they need it. So the disciplinary core ideas are built on the notion of learning as a developmental progression. Domain three are the cross-cutting concepts. There are seven cross-cutting concepts that are meant to give students an organizational structure to understand the world and help students make sense of and connect the core ideas across the disciplines and grade, and grade bands. Some of the, the framework identifies the cross-cutting concepts as patterns, cause and effect, scale, proportion, systems, energy and matter, structure and function, and stability and change of systems. So our charge of educators is really to advance the children's 21st century science skills, their abstract reasoning, their collaborative skills, their ability to learn from peers and through technology, and their flexibility as a learner in a dynamic learning environment. These skills need to be, the students need to be engaged in a dialogue and learning experiences that allow complex topics and ideas to be explored from many angles and many perspectives. They also need to learn how to think and solve problems for which there is no one solution and to learn science skills along the way. As we move forward, this is a very exciting time as we look at the, the uh, new direction that the science standards are moving in, particularly as it results to the technology piece and um, engineering that's, that's being moved into this field. Um, we're going to continue our collaborative work in the district and with our regional team partners through BOCES as we look at our Science 21 curriculum so that we can reflect the new standards in our classroom practice. At this time, our K-1 teachers have been trained and are using the revised curriculum our second grade teachers are currently in the process of learning the new curriculum, and this work will continue as it filters up through grade five. What we talk about as an administrator team, as an administrative team, and also in our groups uh, that building principals are having conversations with their um, teachers, what will this new curriculum, what will our new charge possibly change in some of the traditions we have? So for example, our science fair project. What will our traditional science fair project look a couple of years down the line? Will it be the same? Will it change? Will it be modified? Will we be calling it a science and engineering fair? Will we be calling it an e-steam fair? These are all the things that we're looking to not only reflect changes in our curriculum that are best practices, but also 
um, what are some of the existing experiences we provide for our students that we might develop and change over time as well. And here's just a couple of more projects. There were 200, how many, is it Dr. Roberts, how many fifth graders? So there were 278, well maybe not so many because there were some teams that worked, there were some projects that were, were worked on as a team of two. So, but there were quite a number of projects there that were shared. Thank any you. questions? Um, Pete, do you have questions? No. Mike? Yeah, I might have missed this, but what, do we have a time frame for how we're phasing these standards in? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm assuming we're not going day one, everything's in, right? I no, right now this, the, the state has identified that this year we are in the transition phase of learning. We're acquiring knowledge about the new standards. They haven't put a very firm timeline on when they would be implemented, but our work with Putnam Northern Westchester BOCES and Science 21 curriculum, that has already, those changes in kindergarten and first grade have already taken place. Uh, just because we're ahead of what the state is, has been asking and we're expecting our second grade mm -hmm. teachers to also be doing that new version of the curriculum next year. So it's not going to be, they're not rushing to make the changes but they, and they haven't given a very rigid timeline but our goal is to co of course move quickly but at a pace that makes sense for the learning of our teachers and the time to change our curriculum. Thank you. I'm good, thanks. Carol? Uh, just a comment, I think it's great how you started with the uh, science fair projects to begin with. Um, one of the things, and I mean, you know, I, we've all been there, you know, the fifth grade science fair, and you know, it's your third one, you're like, oh my gosh, thank God, I'm, you know, I'm done, it was the last one, you know, parents are frantic and everything. But I think what pa parents don't, well, I'm sure parents do realize, but just to point out, all of these things you've mentioned that kids are getting out of this. Mm -hmm. And you don't realize it because I know it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work for the mm -hmm. kids and I know it's a lot of work for the parents and the teachers and the staff, but it's so worth it because mm -hmm. kids are getting so much out of this that you, you just take for granted. You don't even realize it's just happening. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is they either get to choose to work with a partner mm -hmm. or work by themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very considerate as to how people learn, how people want to work, mm -hmm. whether they choose <coughs> you know, to work alone or in a, in a group. It, it doesn't matter mm -hmm. that they can do either. So I just think that's a, a, it was a great way to highlight something that you, know, you kind of lose sight of when you're going through, but mm -hmm. so much is happening and it's all great stuff. So um, that's important to note. Thank you, and I, and I did, when, when Jack was speaking, um, when he was talking about his experience with this whole process and talked about how mm -hmm. the research mm -hmm. aspect of it was a struggle for him initially, and, and um, he didn't seem too impressed with the having to do the research part, and as he talked about how he got through that and was able to learn the best way to approach that, I thought that was so meaningful to the process, <coughs> and that, you know, that really shows what we're hoping our students will learn through their work, how to persevere. Lisa, do you have any comments? Our new board member? <laughs> um, I'm just happy to hear that um, we're taking a look at moving away maybe from the traditional trifold board and seeing where mm -hmm. we can take the science fair to the mm -hmm. next level. Mm -hmm. Because we've been doing that traditional trifold board, board right. for so long mm -hmm. that maybe now it's time to see, okay, where can we take this science right. fair next and yes. take our kids to the next step. Mm -hmm. And is it a combination of a traditional based on what st some students are, are comfortable with or something a little bit different based on maybe some engineering principles or, or various aspects? So it's a whole new world. It's all great stuff. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm always just impressed that I think we're, we're far ahead of the curve because you look at what the new standards are, but we've already implemented. Mm -hmm. we, we started with STEM a few years ago with, mm -hmm. with Ron, we're doing E-STEAM. So we are so far much further ahead of the curve than um, you know, mm -hmm. people who are just starting off, and, and it, I'm always so proud of this district that that we are. We we've always been advancing the knowledge and the curiosity of our students because that's really what we're trying to do is to get them to be curious. Because right. once they're curious, they can learn anything. And and we've had a strong science curriculum K-12. And when you look at what's really new, you know, we've we've had the disciplinary core ideas, we've had the cross-cutting concepts. What's really yeah. new is the embedded <coughs> science and engineering practices that start right at kindergarten and and work their way right up through. Um, our, our K-12 environment, so it's going to be very exciting. I'm Thanks. looking forward to it. <laughs> Soon we're not going to have any subjects, it's all going to be one big thing, which is mm -hmm. fine too. That's great. Thank you so much. <coughs> all right. What are we up to? We're up to our superintendent report. Huh? Yes.
So I'd like to. Be before we start, can I just please. introduce everybody to Lisa Roland is our newest board member. She's replacing Tom Donatelli, so we welcome her. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Now we can start. <laughs> so I wanted to take this opportunity to first acknowledge and welcome Lisa Roll to our board. Uh, I believe the board made a wonderful selection in selecting Lisa, and I look forward to her many contributions to the district and to the board. So thank you and welcome to the Yorktown Board of Education. Thank you. The, uh, before we get started with our first of seven budget presentations throughout this budget season, I'd just like to ask Mr. Cole to give us an update on the request for proposals that are out there for the internal auditors, if you can just provide us with a quick update. Sure. The, uh, the internal auditor, uh, the claims auditor uh, RFP was accepted at the last board meeting, uh, Dr. Hatter, and that went, that's going well. Uh, he's, he's already been here for his first stint, and that went very well. The external uh, auditor's request for proposal was uh, sent out to six CPA firms in our region, and all six replied. Uh, so all of those proposals have been forwarded to the Board of Education, and we look forward to their input as to how they'd like to proceed. Thank you for that update. Just a quick question is, our external auditor starts their work in, in the end of the spring, correct? So we have, it's, it's not a crisis well, if we don't do it within the next week? No, that's correct. But they, they do start the work a little bit sooner than the end of the spring. Uh, typically, their first visit is in January or February. Okay. Um, and then, but the lion's share of the work is certainly done at the end of the school year. Okay. Good. Uh, just a few upcoming events that I would want to share with you. First of all, our uh, Yorktown da High School Dance Company put on an amazing performance this past weekend. The, the talent of our students runs so deep, and that was just one example of it. And. I was joined by Ms. Carbone, and I was joined by Ms. O'Shea, and Dr. McGinnis was also in the audience uh, at the Friday evening performance that I, that I attended. And uh, February 10th, our band and orchestras are putting on the swing dance, so if you're interested in getting dance lessons, <laughs> to see me embarrass myself trying to get a dance lesson, you're <laughs> welcome to come out to that event. It's sure to be a wonderful time for our students, for our families. February 26th is Bandapalooza, just a modified start time on that. It will be 6 p.m., our board meeting, and, and I thank the board for, for really demonstrating the commitment to our students. You pushed your start time to 7.15. That was something that was very generous of you to do, and I appreciate you doing that. So our board meeting will be here on the 26th at 7.15 p.m. And then finally, the Foundation for Excellence is having their annual event on March 24th, and I put in a plug because they're honoring a tremendous educator, the uh, my right hand, literally, and they're honoring Mrs. O'Shea, so if you're able to come out, I really encourage you to be there. They, they could not have selected someone better to honor for this year, and so I'll certainly be out, and I know many of our colleagues will also be joining us, and members of the board will also be joining us. So with that said, I'm going to make my way to the podium so that I can deliver the first budget presentation of our budget season. So excuse me as I just move over to that side. And am I operating, am I operating under the Google Slides version? Okay, thank you. Okay. So my topic is far less interesting than purifying water and making electricity from salt water and even the process behind the science fair. However, I will do my best to props. maintain the attention. <laughs> I'm all you got. <laughs> so uh, kudos to, you'll notice the background here. Kudos to Mr. Cole. This was his idea to use the E-STEAM logo design winner as the background for this slide. So this logo was part of our competition that we ran, our contest that we ran, and it's the artwork of Ryan Serafin, our 11th grade student, and I had lunch with Ryan and his parents, mm -hmm. and it was absolutely wonderful, and Ryan has been still continuing to refine this work so that if we do decide to print this on T-shirts and on other stickers, that the color is optimized for the different backgrounds. So uh, my highest commendation to Ryan, his work continues even after uh, coming out ahead in the contest. 
So I'd like to just begin with a quick quote, and this quote means a lot to me, and I'm sure you've all seen it. Excellence is not an act, it's a habit. It's what we do here, it's a part of the Yorktown culture. And I really believe that the school budget tells the story of a district. We, we can speak about all of the wonderful things that happen, but it's really the allocation of monies and what programs we decide to bring to the forefront and what programs ultimately that our administration decides to present to the board that demonstrates where our values really reside. And so where are we? And what is our story? Well, the story at this juncture is in our 2020 vision plan. And the 2020 vision plan is really grounded in this word that we've come to know, E-STEAM. Empathy underpinning all of the work in STEAM education. That's a huge part of our identity as a district here. STEAM is important, but without that understanding and that compassion and that empathy for those who are experiencing whatever struggle they're experiencing, then, then empathy, uh, then STEAM is all for naught. And my commendation to our principals, to the instructional leaders throughout the district, to Mrs. O'Shea, to Mr. Cole for all of their work in advancing the E-STEAM work as we're developing the budget and as we talk about budget, it's Mr. Cole who's saying, well, Dr. Hatter, are we con what are we considering with E-STEAM? And, and he's certainly keeping that on, at the front of our mind. So I appreciate all of our efforts. It's a team lift in developing this. So what's our current status? What is our story right now as a district? Well, it's an excellent one. Our instructional program is rigorous. We give students appropriately challenging opportunities to advance themselves. Our learning outcomes, character education program, graduation rates, you, look, you name it, you look at the metric and they're amongst the best in Westchester County, New York State, and the United States. We have so many different co-curricular activities. No matter what your interest is, there's something here for you. And if there isn't, bring it to us and we'll talk about putting it into our program for next year. Our athletics program has been so successful, both on the field and off the field. Our entire fall athletics program were recognized as student athlete scholars. That is a very high threshold and a very difficult threshold to meet. And every one of our athletic teams in the fall met that threshold. That's absolutely remarkable. Our students volunteer. Their generosity of spirit is really second to none. They give of themselves and give of themselves and give their time and volunteer for all of these wonderful organizations and raise money for all these wonderful organizations. And in the immediate moment, the beneficiary may be the organization on the other end of our donation, but long term, the beneficiaries are our students. They're learning the important gifts of selflessness at such an early age. And of course, our innovative e-STEAM approach. There's no other district doing it this way. And we're out in front in that regard. And I believe it positions our students to be the change agents, the positive change agents that we seek in the world moving forward. And the world is changing. There's no question that the world is changing. And it's not only changing the way students function, it's the way we teach and the way students learn in the classroom. And it's a shifting of our practice and our work with, with our students. Some things that you may or may not have known. More people own a mobile device than a toothbrush. That's a fact. And then you can go on and on and on. But ultimately, by the end of this year, the belief is that video will take over mobile usage. Most data plans are now going unlimited because the video consumption is tremendous and the data being consumed by video is tremendous. As you, as you think about it in your own lives, as you want to learn something new, whether it's how to replace a light bulb in a car, I, I just was on YouTube trying to replace a light bulb, a headlight, I had no idea how to do it, so where did I go? I went to YouTube, it didn't help me, but I still tried to go to YouTube to learn that skill. So that is just the way of the world, and that's where we shifted. By 2020, <coughs> I found this to be very interesting. The average person will have more conversations with bots than their spouses. And you think about all the bots that are out there, Siri, Alexa, hey Google, I have all three of those in my home. And I find myself communicating with Alexa and saying, Alexa, remind me to buy lemons at my, uh, at, on the shopping list. And sure enough, Alexa's reliable, she never forgets. It's always, and it gets transported to my phone. More and more of these are entering households and it's changing the dynamics in households and the way we do business. 
In fact, uh, there was one survey that I reviewed recently that suggested that Alexa will become the least popular name of children <laughs> moving forward <laughs> because calling out for your child will have, prompt Alexa to ask what she can do to help. I've showed this picture to our board previously. I've shown it to our staff. However, our community has, I have not shared this with members of our community and I thought it appropriate to do so if my words don't convey the change that our climate has undergone, that our, that our world has undergone, I think these images outside of the Vatican will. So this is outside of the Vatican in 2005, prior to the announcement of Pope Benedict. And this is that same scene outside of the Vatican in 2013 with the announcement of Pope Francis. If these images don't clearly convey the change that the world has undergone, I'm not quite sure what image would be more powerful in conveying that message. Now, as we enter budget season, and this is the first of seven presentations, I always like to kick off with an essential question because building a budget not only tells the story, but there are many questions that we ask of ourselves. I believe this is our guiding question, so I will read it to you. I apologize for reading from the slide. So with the fiscal constraints placed upon the district as a result of the tax levy cap, increasing enrollment, which we'll talk about, and rising costs, which we'll also talk about. How do we continue to offer our students new and innovative learning opportunities to ensure they're positioned to meet the demands of a changing world? And that's the question that we grapple with as we develop this budget and ultimately will present to the board for their approval, for their adoption. And it's not just about technology. The changing world is not just about technology. We don't want children to become proficient users of technology. That's not the goal here. The goal is far beyond technology. We want them to be creators of technology, not just consumers of technology, but it's about problem solving, strategic thinking, project management, and the ability to work with others in a team. That's the way of the world today, and I think our schools need to model that. I'd like you to meet Emma. Emma is a fifth grade student at Crown Pond School. It's a lovely young lady. I actually had a phone conversation with her mother today to uh, just learn a little bit more about Emma outside of school. I've met Emma several times in school, and she has always greeted me with the biggest, warmest smile, and has always greeted me by name. And so this is Emma with her younger brother at the science fair last week at Crown Pond. And as we develop the budget, what I like to do and what our team will do is we will get down to a granular level and look at this budget development process through the eyes of a student, and what's their experience in our schools, and how can we better that next year. So with Emma, and you already remember Emma because Emma helped us, the winning team that is, to design a tower that uh, was certainly freestanding, that supported the weight of the uh, ball that, that they gave us to support. And there's Trustee Magnani putting the capstone on our project uh, under Emma's direction, of course. Yeah, because you couldn't do it yourself. No. And you can see me in the background with the look of trepidation that I wasn't sure if it would stick or not. <clears throat> and that's Emma standing triumphantly after we successfully erected the tower. As we build this budget, we build it for Emma. And we build it for the other 4,451 students in the district. The goal, 3,451, did I give us an extra thousand? Yeah. <laughs> so I built, <laughs> enrollment is going up though, which is not to that extent. As we design this budget, we design this for Emma, and we design this for the needs that Emma has, and we design this for the needs that all of the students in the district have. Sure, academics are important. It's really important to design these instructional opportunities that advance our students and, and put them into more rigorous courses and courses that reflect robotics and engineering and, and so many other innovative opportunities that we'd like to give our children. But it doesn't just stop with academics. We educate the whole child and it has to be about the whole child. And Emma has many different parts to her. And the 3,451 other students in the district have many other interests as well. And I believe it's incumbent upon us in this budget development process to reflect those interests. Emma's a dancer. She, she dances hip hop and she also does some Irish step dancing. Emma's a singer as well. Emma sings in her church choir at St. Pat's. Emma is also an actress. She was in Peter Pan and Emma will also be in another production this year, Wizard of Oz. We can support all of that here. We have a wonderful 
program here in dancing. We have a wonderful choral program here. We have a wonderful instrumental music program should Emma decide that she'd like to be part of that. Our students are great actors and great actresses. We have something there for her as well. In terms of character education, Emma gives of herself and, and works with so many different organizations to help out. We have that here too. Athletics, Emma's a cheerleader. Her, her uh, team finished in second place at nationals earlier this month. We have that for her as well. And I could have put up a picture of any one of our children. And the important goal here in the budget development process is to make sure that we're meeting the needs of our students. After all, educating the mind without educating the heart, it really is no education at all. <clears throat> now, there are some key elements to the 1819 budget. And there are some factors that are going to counter some of the good things that are happening. There's rising costs. That's a reality that we're facing. There's a tax levy cap. Sure, that we're mindful of. So just to take you through, we anticipate the tax levy cap to be at 2%. So that is a number that is governed by a formula that's dictated by the state. We'll actually have a presentation on that. Mr. Cole in February will share that with the board and with the community. We have rising enrollment. We anticipated there'd be a decline. Sure enough, there were 64 new students that we gained in July and August, and we have new students continuing to come into our schools. That necessitates staffing increases, and that also necessitate program increases. So with regard to a demographic study, the district commissioned Dr. Seversky to perform a demographic study so that we can better understand what to expect down the road. It's really difficult to prepare a budget without understanding what's coming through the pike with regard to enrollment. So draft reports show that there's no relief in sight with regard to enrollment. So we're still working through the report in draft form. Once we receive a final report, we'll certainly share it with the board. We're still analyzing the data that's coming through. We'll we're showing, although there's a modest decrease, we also showed a modest decrease last year. We had 64 new students enrolled, so I don't anticipate that changing. And also with housing developments that are on the horizon in town, I only anticipate enrollment increasing moving forward. Staffing. Levels have to align with enrollment. Enrollment drives staffing. Students drive program. That's been the mantra here. That will continue to be the mantra here. Students drive what we do here. We service all students here. And also, we have some retirements to date, and the board will be accepting those this evening, and ESTEAM staffing considerations. We're looking to advance this work. We're looking to cultivate creativity and innovation in our students, and that will come with some staffing as well. Pension and health insurance increase, we're facing some rising costs here. The employer contribution to TRS is going up to 11% this coming school year, and that's about $680,000 that we need to come up with as a district. That's the first $680,000 spent. And then when we look at health insurance costs, that's about $435,000 in increases. So we're over a million dollars in increased costs right out of the gate. Cash reserves, we, we do have reserves that are there. We have a double A uh, plus credit rating with Standard & Poor's. So the district financially is in wonderful shape. Our audits reflect that, all measures. We uh, just received the controller's um, fiscal stress test results, and they were wonderful, absolutely wonderful. We'll be sharing more information once we analyze that, but they were absolutely wonderful. So by all metrics, the district is managing the money. That's under the guidance of the Financial and Fiscal Advisory Committee, under Mr. Cole, of course. And uh, so that part of our organization is something that we have some control over, and that part is certainly favorable to us. Another favorable piece of the budget is state aid. We received word last week that we can expect about $600,000, a little bit more than $600,000 in an increase from the governor's proposed budget. Again, that's subject to change. It's not final until the budget is ultimately authorized and approved. But at the present moment, it stands at about a $600,000 increase. So that's favorable to us as well. And certainly our capital reserve fund, which was established this past school year, we're uh, looking to begin extracting some monies to invest in our facilities and in, in our physical plant. We are allowed to have $12 million over a 10-year period. It's currently funded at a $6 million level, and there are some wonderful projects, and there are some huge benefits to having a capital reserve fund. You forego interest costs and all the bond costs and costs associated with borrowing money. 
So we will be looking for voter authorization in May, and we'll certainly outline a schedule of projects that we're considering. The district steering committee has been very actively meeting and discussing what projects and prioritizing projects. So there'll, there'll be more to come this spring with that. And then finally, ECM investments. It's a big part of our identity here. It's a big part of what we do in Yorktown. And so we're looking at new course proposals, some very exciting course proposals moving forward, some very exciting investments in coding and robotics and feeder programs at the earlier grades. And we're looking to upgrade facilities, to continue to upgrade our facilities to reflect the ESTEAM approach to education. And obviously staffing and materials need to be on our mind as well as we build this budget. And with regard to our process, as I indicated, we have already begun the process. The process begins pretty early in the school year. You're just starting one school year when, you're plan when you begin planning for the next school year. And this is the first of seven meetings. April 16th will be the final meeting. That's the superintendent's bu budget presentation. On the 30th, it's anticipated that the board will adopt the budget. May 7th, there'll be the public uh, budget hearing. And then on May 15th, we have the budget vote and trustee election. Now, just to give you a breakdown of January to April, how that looks, here's the schedule of meetings. Mr. Cole will deliver the next five presentations and, and will obviously be adding more understanding as, we, as numbers that are projected become more finalized, as some fluid uh, news that we have becomes more solid, we'll certainly be adding to our understanding, which will in turn add to your understanding and the community's understanding of all the numbers as they shape up. And then I just come back to the essential question, that's the work ahead. The work is balancing the needs of our students with sensitivity to the taxpayer. That, that's really the work of, in developing this budget. So next steps, what are we doing? We're going to continue to evaluate staffing and programming needs. We'll certainly continue to explore different programs that we can put into our instructional program, whether it's during the school day, after school clubs, uh, and ultimately it's a budget that's respectful of taxpayers as well. So just a reminder, the budget vote and trustee election is May 15th. Polls are open from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. and the voting location is at Mohansic Elementary School. So at this point, we'd be happy to welcome any questions that you have or answer any concerns or, or inquiries that you have. Anything at this point? Um, no, I'm sure I will. <laughs> the questions start. <laughs> right, Mike, will go to you. No, I don't have any questions. I thought it was a very uh, great overview, and I like the direction that we're heading in. So when we get down to the numbers, we'll uh, hopefully can fit it all in. Sure. I'm good, thanks. Carol? No, I'm good, thank you. Lisa? No, no questions, thank you. <laughs> Pete? <laughs> I guess again, you said, I said I'd circle back to you. No, no, I meant once oh, the actual starts. presentation okay. start. <laughs> I just have a question about the Siversky study. Sure. And um, enrollment because last year it was off. Was it? I know this verse study went out ten years, but it, it's only managed to make it seven before we had. I guess the economic changes helped change the survey. Well, the the last Siversky report we did did not have as a known variable uh, new community developments that are uh, the the one proposed development on in the Mohansic school boundary. Uh, down by where the new Lowe's uh, is going in um, has only been known for the last two years. That's the proposed one or the new one? That's there's the, there's one that's, that's in the, and then there's a new one. The that's proposed the proposed one. one. And that's, right. that's what's going to have uh, the most significant immediate impact. Because that, that could be up to 100 units. And the development just down the street uh, where there were 26 units, we were experiencing on average two school-age children per unit sold. So if you can extrapolate that to 100 unit development. <clears throat> That's a lot. And then the other question I have is, what do we know the effect that full day kindergarten had on our enrollment? Did that affect it in, um, in, an, in more of an increase than we expected? Do we know that? We haven't seen that. Um, since its inception, uh, the kindergarten numbers have been low. It's only in the last two years, you'd say, Ron? Two or three years that we've seen uh, uh, a, a tick up in the uh, kindergarten numbers, and it's mostly on one side of the town. So um, I wouldn't say that full day kindergarten has exceeded our estimates for what enrollment would be. So the increase in enrollment is actually new people moving into yes, town. Yes, that, that, that we're certain okay. of. Yep. 
Okay, I thank you so much for your attention. And I just, it, this is a picture that will stay with our team as we develop the budget. And this is certainly something that we ask that will stay with the board as well as we continue to develop the budget. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, thank you. All right. All right we're going to move on. Mm -hmm. We've got a personnel agenda. Well, upon recommendation of the superintendent, a motion of the following be approved. Um, we have resignations for the purpose of retirement. We have Cheryl Goldberg, Elizabeth Pusiferi, Sue Sniffen, Al Torrente, Ann Vole, and Catherine Young. We have classified personnel retiring as well, Marianne Decker and Diane Frail. And then we have one addition to the substitute list. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ron, did you want to say something? Just a thank you. For the number of years of service of those who are retiring are tremendous, and their contribution to the district is, is even greater than the number of years of service so, so to the six teachers who are retiring and the two office assistants. I thank you. The board thanks you. You've, the impact that you've had on our students has been profound, and I wish you well in retirement. Thank you. Uh, we have board reports. Um, Audit committee. P. <laughs> Sorry, Pete. Um, I'll let Tom do it. <laughs> <laughs> sure. The um, as as you know, the the chair of the of our audit committee, Mr. Donatelli, uh, resigned from the board recently. But um, the audit committee um, uh, did meet um, recently to go over. Uh, some of the more recent audit reports that have been done for the school district and that have been reported out on our website into uh, New York State uh, uh, Comptroller's Office. The next big thing for the audit committee and the board in general is going to be the external audit request for proposals that we talked about earlier this evening. We have six of those proposals uh, with CPA firms in the immediate area, so that will be the, the thrust for that committee. Okay, thank you. Fiscal Advisory, Mike? So Fiscal Advisory Committee met on the uh, 16th, the morning of the 16th, last week, to um, discuss the potential financial impact of ongoing uh, contractual negotiations. And uh, we may, we anticipate possibly meeting again uh, in the near future to try to iron out uh, some sort of agreement. And, and we'll get into the budget season after that. So it's, uh, it's going to be a busy one. Yes, it is. Policy, Cheryl? Uh, yeah, the policy committee last met on January 9th, and um, we're continuing just to move through uh, each policy and review it. Uh, this week, this, tonight, we have five policies that the board will read after we've made some recommendations and changes and to hopefully later adopt. Um, we will have three that will be deleted um, because their duplicates are no longer needed. Um, and we're meeting next on February 13th. Terrific. And then steering, uh, we are meeting next week to uh, look at and refine the projects that we would like to bring to, forward to the board for a potential um, use for the capital reserve fund. So that, that's our process. And hopefully next week we'll have something to uh, come back to the board with. All right. We're open. Up to approval, uh, board action and approval of minutes. A motion to approve the minutes from the December 18th and the January 8th meetings. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Treasurer's report. A motion to approve the treasurer's report for December 2017. So Second. moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Claims audit report. A motion to approve the claims audit report for December 2017. So moved. Second. Discussion? Um, there was. A comment from the claims auditor that he's still awaiting access to be able to um, get things uploaded into the shared drive. We have things in, in this particular case. The supporting documentation wasn't uploaded by the time he was looking at it. It does exist. It just wasn't put into the shared so drive. So do we now have a process so that it gets uploaded before he's looking at it? So we we've, don't have we've had that discussion, and 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 we're hopeful that um, the culture will change. Yes. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Extra classroom activity, motion to approve the extra classroom activity report for December 2017. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Policies. First reads. The board will conduct a first read on the following policies. 1721, student teaching and internship. 1800, gifts from the public. 
1925, Interpreters for Hearing Impaired Parents, 9130, Sexual Harassment of Employees, and 9140.1, Staff Complaints and Grievances. So does anybody have any questions on them? Okay. If you do, please I get did. to Cheryl. I um, did. Hmm, you did? Yeah. What's your question? <clears throat> the one on gifts from the public. Yes. I, and I appreciate how we've been able to really streamline these and take out a lot of verbiage that we don't need. But I wasn't clear after reading this, because we took out some stuff in the beginning, about whether the Board of Ed is now the only one who can accept a gift, or does the superintendent still have the ability to accept gifts under a certain amount? The Board accepts everything. Okay, it's, so it's we like eliminated that, that piece. If okay. you think about our practice, then we accept a, you know, $15 yes. worth of gift transfer donation. Okay, so we're changing the policy to take away the superintendent's ability, because he never used it anyway. Or to reflect our current practices, yeah. yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That was it? Yeah. Thank you for reading. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Deletion. Be it resolved that the following Thank you for doing exhibits. your job, really. <laughs> I'm sorry. Shall be a delete. Nobody has questions, so it's either Cheryl and I are doing the best job in the entire world, or. <laughs> That's it? Okay, I'll take it. Thank you. <laughs> be it resolved that the following exhibit shall be deleted from the policy manual because the forms are not necessary or utilized. So 1721E for student teaching and internship, 1925E uh, for interpreters, and the other 19E2 for uh, interpreters. Motion. So moved. Second. Discussion. I just want people to, what, the exhibits, one of the reasons we're getting rid of the exhibits is most of them are electronic forms now. We don't need paper forms of these things. And, and so anything electronic does not need to be in the policy manual. So all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Business office. Uh, resolved upon recommendation of the superintendent, the Board of Education of the Yorktown Central School District hereby accepts the proposal submitted by Aris Contracting Company, Inc. for construction management services. President of the Board of Education is hereby authorized to enter into agreement with ARIS contracting pending district council review. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, resolved upon recommendation of the superintendent, the Board of Ed of the Yorktown Central School District hereby accepts the proposal submitted by KSQ Design for Architectural and Engineering Services. President of the Board of Education is hereby authorized to enter into direct agreement with KSQ Design pending district council review. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Settlement agreement be it resolved that the Board of Education hereby approves a settlement of prevailing party attorney fees with regard to SED case number 506556 and be it further resolved that the Board of Education does hereby authorize the superintendent of schools to execute such settlement on a part of the district. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? On um, public health and welfare contracts, a motion to approve the contract for health and welfare si services provided to resident pupils attending non-public schools in other districts for the 17-18 school year. This is for Ossining and Valhalla. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye opposed? Uh, non-public welfare contracts for non-residents resolved upon recommendation of superintendent. Hereby authorizes the resolved. That doesn't make sense what's written there, Yvette. <laughs> The board hereby authorizes the Board of Education president to execute contracts for health and welfare services provided to students who reside in other districts but are attending non-public schools in the Yorktown Central School District during the 17-18 school year. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We have a budget transfer as below. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Special ed. Motion to arrange the following special ed placements as of January 22nd, 2018. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Gifts, grants, and donations. A motion to accept with gratitude the following gifts, grants, and donations. To the Yorktown High School, one TKL trombone case from Miss Eileen Zidi, one Silvertone acoustic guitar and case, a model SD50, and one Bursa Wood acoustic guitar from Miss Diane Frail, two student model trumpets, Bassoon case, violin, bow, and case, and music books for Mr. and Mrs. Virgo. And at the middle school, $500 from the Anderson family as part of a matching grant with Regeneron. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We thank everybody for their very generous donations. We are up to board comments. Pete. Mike. 
No, I'm okay. Reshmi? I'm good, thanks. Cheryl? Um, I, I, the one thing I noticed about tonight is uh, the term e-steam has quickly taken on speed. Um, it's become becoming part of our brand. And I just wanted to comment how in everything I heard tonight, every presenter, every presentation that we heard tonight, um, it was clearly woven through. So I think that's you know a compliment to our staff, our parents, and our, uh, definitely our students. So it's nice that we don't just um, you know talk the talk, but we actually walk the walk. And that was really prevalent tonight. And it has been in all of the presentations. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, kudos to everyone involved um, for making that, that connection. Terrific. Lisa, would you like to say anything? You don't uh, have to. I'll put you on. No. <laughs> no uh, thank you for inviting me to be a part of the board and um, for being so welcoming. And I look forward to working with everyone. And we certainly look forward to working with you. <laughs> and we are glad you're part of our team. We know you have some great strengths. And we are really looking forward to it. So thank you. Um, thank you for the first of our budget presentations. Now the hard work begins. We know this was the easy one. <laughs> so we thank you. Um, Ron, Lisa, Tom, anything you'd like to say? No? Okay. Uh, so we're up to public comment. Anybody in the audience wishing to speak? No? Nope. Can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Good night. Mm -hmm.